Welcome to History Comes Alive, the podcast that takes you on a deep dive into a new historical topic every episode. Join us as we explore the nuances of historical events you probably didn't learn about in school. Here's your host, Jeff Nichols. Welcome back. The last two weeks, we've met the Pequots as a people and come to understand their dealings with both the Dutch and the English. Their reputation by many has been that of bloodthirsty monsters. But that reputation may not be warranted by the historical evidence, especially from a European standpoint. The Dutch had made agreements with them that were very one-sided. Then, through the John Stone murder, the English had as well. It was remembered as the Treaty of 1634. As we ended our time together last week, we came to understand, quote, the agreement in part obligated the English to deliver European goods to the Pequots, and helped to negotiate peace with the Narragansetts. The treaty obligated the Pequots to much more. They were to deliver the remaining two killers of John Stone to the English, allow the English unfettered access to Connecticut, and deliver an obnoxious amount of wampum to Boston. Why not? The goal was money. The money was in the wampum. The chief wampum producers, or those who controlled most of the production, needed English support. All of this without actually agreeing to lend any military support whatsoever. It was a very lopsided treaty agreed to by Pequot ambassadors that had zero authority to commit to these terms. And the fallout would be horrific. End quote. This week, we'll continue to develop the Pequots through the lens of English activity in Pequot territory and Pequot discipline and attempted diplomacy. They never did produce the remaining murderers of John Stone, but they did allow unfettered English settlement into their lands. The official breakdown of Pequot and English relations revolved around whether the Treaty of 1634 was ratified. The Pequots said that it was not. The English would not take no for an answer. To me, it represents a kind of diplomatic shotgun wedding. The English said it was ratified, so it was. If last week's episode represented the left bookend to destruction, this week's episode will represent the middle, where the books, I mean, the real information is located, as far as English expansion and Pequot destruction are concerned. As a precursor to this episode, I want to point out that our narrative will move pretty quickly. I want to hit the high points of English expansion, or as you could label this aptly enough, the English invasion of Connecticut. The information will be new or from a slightly tilted vantage from some of our earlier episodes, but this is where these will all begin to tie together. We won't be mentioning New Haven, remember that ill-fated colony at this time, but they were settled around the time that we're developing right now, 1637 actually. Remember, they were the colony that formed because the Puritans in Massachusetts Bay were too lenient in their eyes. They're probably the only guys that thought that way. But I do want to draw your attention to some of the episodes that we've covered that also dealt with these times and regions. And you can take it as a reminder, but if you're new or newer to History Comes Alive, these references may provide context and places to gain a broader perspective of what we've been talking about, if you haven't listened to them already. So I've said several times that I like to look at history, and my goal here is to understand it not always in chronological order, but through a series of transparencies that can be laid one upon another and continue to develop a deeper illustration. It's like history is so often presented as two-dimensional, and it really should be presented as three-dimensional. So this episode, if you're so inclined, parallels several other episodes that we've already worked through. The Founding of Plymouth, episode 10, the founding of Massachusetts Bay, episode 11, the founding of Saybrook, which was episode 12, the development, the controversies and opponents of Massachusetts Bay, the Bible state, can be found in episodes 23 through 26 with the focus on Roger Williams and Ann Hutchinson. It's in these episodes that we met Harry Vane, the influential governor of our story today, who would eventually be run out of Massachusetts Bay and all the way back to England. 
And there were episodes where we developed the life of Governor John Mason, the anti-Puritan, whose untimely death actually saved the Puritan state. If you recall, he died en route more than likely to dissolve Massachusetts Bay, and that would have changed our history completely. And lastly, back in episodes 20 and 21, we developed the wampum industry from the early 1620s through the controversy of the times that we're in right now. All of these previous series or episodes led to this time, or actually happened within the time frame that we're talking about. Yes, there was a lot happening. Expansion, controversies within certain groups, conflict without certain groups, conflict between native groups, conflict between European groups, conflict between Europeans and natives, all of which is coming to a head between the years 1634 and 1637, all of which will help to secure New England for the English with devastating losses to the Dutch and more so for many of the natives. Not just the English, the Puritan state of Massachusetts Bay, who would wield disproportionate power and influence for hundreds of years. So there it is. There's been a lot of background developed to get to this point. So the Treaty of 1634 between the English and the Pequots was one-sided and never ratified by the Pequots. They had found themselves in a tough spot. One thing that became obvious very quickly was that the English were not joking when they negotiated for access to the Pequot territories of Connecticut. They came with a determination that defied principle, as with most migrations once they begin. That's what we want to understand this week, the mass migration. As we've seen in previous episodes, it had already begun a few years earlier. There was a trickle of English activity, but a growing interest, a growing recognition of the potential. So much so that Massachusetts Bay declined Plymouth's invitation for a joint venture, not for lack of interest, but because they did not want to share the profits. In fact, with their numbers and resources, they were primed to simply take over. Here's how that happened. This will be chronological. This portion of the narrative does present a sequence of events that most necessarily build one upon the other. So as the Western Territory of Connecticut was beginning to draw everyone's attention, the Puritans of Massachusetts Bay used their new trading vessel, the Blessing of the Bay, to visit New Amsterdam and explore Long Island Sound and then Connecticut. They met with the Dutch Director General Van Twiller, and were quite blunt and, frankly, in my opinion, belligerent. They told him that he needed to cease and desist from Dutch expansion, as the land had already been granted to them by the English king. Now, Van Twiller, for his part, seems to have been the more civilized and experienced diplomat in this exchange, or at least smart enough to realize that the English had him beat by numbers of population. So he recommended that they hand this dispute over to each of their higher authorities in the home country. The final report of these trips went something like this. I mean, basically, the natives are fierce and dangerous. The mouth of the Connecticut River was, quote, barred at the entrance. They could not find one fathom of water, end quote. But there was an enormous wealth to be had here. The wampum was in great supply. The money, the potential for the accumulation of wealth, piqued their curiosity. So in the summer of 1633, a trader named John Oldham, a confidant of John Winthrop Sr. in Massachusetts Bay, but also a Plymouth exile, visited the region for the Puritans. And one can already see the issues of contention building between the English, and they will keep building. Oldham and his crew traveled the footpaths of the natives and stayed with them in their villages every night throughout the whole region. His report would be most favorable he found the locals to be very hospitable and welcoming. The natives, he reported, had invited and encouraged them to settle a colony. It must have been about as good as it gets at this point. He was trading mere trinkets for wampum and beaver pelts, so he's making money and he's having a good time doing it. A location was chosen a few miles south of current Hartford, Connecticut, and samples of black lead and hemp were collected, which demonstrated the superior agricultural opportunities compared to the Boston area. So friendly natives, good farming soil, wampum, and furs. That's a great place to raise a family, isn't it? 
1634, a group of people from Watertown, some say Newton, and which was later Cambridge, but I believe it was Watertown, Massachusetts, left the Bible state to settle an area that would become Wethersfield, Connecticut. Now, for his part, because of the reported opportunity, John Oldham was given access to a 60-ton pinnace to use to open up the Connecticut trade for Massachusetts Bay. One goal was to settle this rich region now, I mean, before everybody else did, but the longer-term strategy was to eventually gain access to the upper New Netherland regions where the Iroquois would be helpful in opening up the trade of the interior around the Great Lakes. That would be the mother load. The Dutch were there for the time being, and the French would be a challenge later. But that's a narrative that we're going to get to in the coming months. It will be the real battle for New England and the Great Lakes, dividing both the French and the English, as well as the Iroquois and the Huron and Ottawa. As a benchmark and a comparison of what wealth was being realized and what wealth could be realized, Alfred A. Cave reports that the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1632 and 33, acquired 622 pelts, okay? While at the same time, the Iroquois had delivered 10,000 pelts to the Dutch. Let that disparity in trade sink in. 622 pelts to 10,000 pelts. Process that. Do the math. Tell me what type of motivation that may provoke. The Puritans had to act aggressively. The pilgrims of Plymouth were already moving into Connecticut. The Dutch were already established. So the Puritans had to act. At this time, they received help in the guise of a time delay from three unexpected natural phenomenon that froze everybody in their tracks. And trade slowed to a trickle. First of all, there was an epidemic that afflicted Plymouth that took 20 English lives and more natives. So they were leery. And secondly, this was the time that the Dutch traders had set themselves up to retake the lost trade the Plymouth folks had taken when they entered the region. You remember this from last week's episode. They were living among the natives, just waiting for the furs to be available for purchase. That was the winter the smallpox epidemic hit the interior native tribes similar to the coastal tribes 15 years earlier. Well, The Dutchmen barely managed to live through the starvation and disease, but eventually made their way to the relative safety of the Plymouth camp, where they were slowly nursed back to health and allowed to return to the House of Good Hope. I mean, that's kind of nice to see, right? I mean, even with the growing tension, the pilgrims had rendered aid when necessary to the European rivals. But the fuse was lit, and within a few weeks, the entire region was feeling the impact of the epidemic. There was another event that caused some concern and delay that I would not have included, but for the fact that we will soon be living the same phenomenon in my region of New York State this year. It was recorded by Governor Bradford that, quote, the spring before, and especially all the month of May, there was such a quantity of great sort of flies, like for bigness to wasps or bumblebees, which came out of holes in the ground and replenished all the woods and ate the green things, and made such a constant yelling noise as made all the woods ring of them, and ready to deaf the hearers. They have not by English been heard or seen before or since. But the Indians told them that sickness would follow, and so it did in June, July, August, and the chief heat of summer. End quote. The, quote, great sort of flies, end quote, were the 17-year locusts, and were unrelated, as we now know, to the sickness. But as the locusts left, the epidemic ended in Plymouth, leaving the English to ponder its beneficent effect as a reminder of the awful power and majesty of God. God's affliction of the saints at Plymouth had been gentle, but disease soon struck the Indians of the Connecticut Valley and the Dutch traders there with the full force of an inexplicable, terrible judgment. Bradford solemnly recounted, quote, some strange and remarkable passages, end quote, which could be construed as evidence that the Almighty had used disease as a means of advancing the cause of the Plymouth traders in Connecticut, end quote. We'll soon find out that it really didn't help the Plymouth traders whatsoever. At any rate, according to Bradford, trade stagnated over these anomalies. If you think about it, it provided time for the Puritans to get their own house in order. 
The idea of colonization farther inland was exciting, but it would be costly for the Massachusetts Bay Colony in manpower. They were under no false delusion of the threats around them. The natives on land and the French who could harass them by land or sea. We've not begun to develop that portion of our story, but we soon will, and it will dwarf what we've seen so far. By 1634, the floodgates were opening. This was the year John Oldham actually began settling Weathersfield. Early on, the case could be made that this was not a legal action, but expansion knew and knows no limits when it's left unchecked. In the September 1634 session of the general court, the legality was hotly debated. Those opposed raised the security aspect, but those in favor argued that the land around Boston was not suitable for large-scale farming. They pointed to the rich soil and fertile flat meadows along the rivers of Connecticut, and it was up to the general court to decide. While the debating and consideration was going on, those desiring to move made their preparations. The exodus had already begun. I mean, the race was on. The arguments were plentiful in favor of migration and expansion. Again, there was the fertility of the land, the extensive fur trade. This area was supplying the Dutch with 15,000 pelts annually. Again, that's a significant number compared to the English hall. There was widespread belief that Sosicus, as the main sacrum of the controlling Pequots, would swing his trade to the English and away from the Dutch. You also had to recognize that the longer that you waited, the more likely the Dutch would further entrench themselves. And in that regard, the Puritans had an advantage over everybody else. They were coming in droves, coming in droves from England and transferring a lot of that population westward. And so truly, the dam had broke. Another transfer of population was the folks of Dorchester, Massachusetts, to the Plymouth area of Windsor. This was a little messy. By July of 1635, the folks from Plymouth would be the first group to feel the pain of Puritan forced expansion. The report was that the Massachusetts Bay men were arriving daily by both water and land. They basically just showed up. They squatted on the land and waited the pilgrims out. They built their houses. They went about their business. The pilgrims had been nice and welcoming at first, playing the good host. But then the guests decided to stay, and not just stay, take over. In fact, when another Puritan group approached the same area, these God-fearing squatters chased them off at gunpoint. Now, the first winter went about as good as Plymouth had years earlier, with the exception of the established Plymouth settlers aiding them. Even so, many returned to Dorchester. Those that stayed eventually settled on a financial buyout, displacing the pilgrims and causing the loss of most of their own investment. In October of 1635, the general court approved the resettlement of Newton by a large majority, and 60 people, men, women, and children, left the security of settled Massachusetts Bay for the unsettled Connecticut. The legal battle was won, and the final New England Puritan push in this initial crucial time came that following year in 1636. Now I say the final New England Puritan push because there would be one more to come that was definitively Puritan, but it was English Puritan, as in from England. And they had a different vision altogether. So the final New England Puritan push came when the town of Newton, Massachusetts, emigrated to what is now Hartford, Connecticut. Their endeavor was almost lost as well. Two vessels carrying most of their provision foundered while trying to reach the safety of Plymouth Harbor during a storm. The crews perished and the cargo washed up on shore. Now, Governor Winslow had the supplies gathered and delivered to the Connecticut settlers at no charge. That must have been quite an expensive undertaking. So even though the loss of Windsor was still fresh on his mind, again, the pilgrims helped those in need. This group was led by the Reverend Thomas Hooker known as the founder and father of both the city of Hartford and the state of Connecticut. Now, he's an interesting guy. He's one of the cast of characters that we could spend weeks on. Thomas Hooker had been born in a small village in the county of Leicestershire, England. 
and like so many of his Puritan counterparts, had enjoyed a good education and a prominent career in England before being forced to flee because of his Puritan views. And he arrived in New England in 1630 and settled Hartford in 1636. He had acquired some notoriety while in Massachusetts Bay, taking part in both the Roger Williams trial and Anne Hutchinson. But perhaps his real claim to fame was to come just a few years later, when he was taking up the challenge to free Connecticut from the grip of Massachusetts Bay. In 1638, he preached a sermon on the text, quote, Choose men of wisdom, understanding, and repute, and the Lord will set them in authority over you. End quote. From this sermon came the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, which is recognized by many as the first written democratic constitution forming a representative government. Whatever he had been in the past, he was not a Massachusetts Bay guy at this point. That's not bad for a small town kid from central England. The final challenge to Plymouth, the final challenge to the Dutch, the final challenge to the New England Puritans and the natives came from across the Atlantic Ocean, from men with a different vision, more closely aligned with Ferdinand Gorges and John Mason. You remember, those were the guys that had been coming down from the North. Those were the guys with a feudal system in mind for colonization. These Puritans coming from across the Atlantic in England were men who wielded real power in England, men backed by a patent granted by the Council for New England. And this patent was granted in 1632, but it took them a few years to have it come to fruition. Now, this final colonial experiment was to be a semi-feudal colony that really took form in August of 1635. Robert Rich, the Earl of Warwick, and others secured a controversial patent. I mean, it was controversial in the fact that it, it may never have actually been ratified. It granted the holders all of the land beginning at the Narragansett Bay and continuing on until the Pacific Ocean. That's a big chunk of land. Never mind the natives or the Europeans that are already living in the region. This was a planned colony for the benefit of the Puritan movement and certain leaders in it as the political climate in England was rapidly deteriorating. So in the summer of 1635, John Winthrop Jr., the son of John Winthrop Sr. of Massachusetts Bay, arrived from England. He had been designated the governor of the new colony and had money and supplies. Men like Sir Richard Saltonstall, Lord Say and Seal, and Lord Brook were determined to establish a colony at the mouth of the Connecticut River. Winthrop had agreed to recruit at least 50 men to build the settlement. It was to be a fort. The chosen place turned out to be at the previous Dutch outpost of Kivet's Hook, which was now completely abandoned. Winthrop moved quickly dispatching 20 advanced men to claim and secure the land. He also claimed he now had jurisdiction over all of Connecticut. That's pretty ballsy. That's quite a claim. He did have at least one advocate, and that was a traveling companion who was the son of King Charles's Chamberlain. He had prestige and position in England, and his name was Henry Vane, the future governor of Massachusetts Bay. Also, as we've talked about in a past episode, the future escapee of Massachusetts Bay when he found himself on the wrong side of the antinomian controversy just a little while later. Originally, the Massachusetts Bay leadership recognized great potential in him, and they made him governor relatively quickly. They saw that potential through not just his natural ability, but his bloodline. But in the end, that wouldn't save Henry Vane. One more important person to our story is Lion Gardner. He was a veteran of the wars against Spain in the Netherlands. He was a Scottish Puritan and an engineer. He'd been handpicked by Lord Say to build the fort at the new colony. Lion Gardner was a fascinating guy who would factor prominently in the drama that was soon to unfold. He's one of the guys I planned on doing a multi-week series on, but we're going to let that go for now. But he's a fascinating guy. I find it interesting that in him, we find another veteran soldier of the wars against Spain, another guy who had spent a decade or more in the employ of the Dutch and was now in the English colonies competing against them, another guy that was English that had worked for the Dutch fighting against the Spanish and was married to a Dutch woman. Lion Gardner was to the new colony 
and Fort, what Miles Standish was to Plymouth. He was as important to the new colony and fort as John Underhill was to so many different colonies of this time. He finished the fort and named it Saybrook in honor of two of his benefactors, Lord Say and Seal and Lord Brooke. Governor Winthrop finally arrived in early 1636. There were other controversies surrounding the population migration, but those are going to have to wait for another day. Connecticut was filling in quite nicely if you were an Englishman, a Puritan Englishman. Not so nicely for everyone else, especially the Pequots, who had basically stepped aside and allowed their country to be settled by foreigners, or at least certain valuable areas of it. Now, soon after Winthrop arrived, there arose rumors and fears that the Pequots were going to attack. If you think about it, that might seem reasonable from an English perspective. I mean, the Pequots had not fulfilled their end of the Treaty of 1634. Never mind that the English really had neither. And the English had just kind of moved right into their land. So John Oldham, the previous year, had again challenged the Pequots about holding up their end of the bargain. And when they still declined, he declared them to be a, quote, very false people, end quote. Really? Really? I mean, do you get that impression from the Pequots, the way the Dutch and the English have handled them? Were they really false? I mean, and frankly, John Oldham, he liked them well enough on previous trips to their neighborhood. So the rumors that emerged are believed to be primarily the work of one man and stirred the imagination of many. Uncas, the chief rival to Sausicus, the main sachem of the breakaway Mohegans, is believed to have spread the rumors. In the environment that these guys were all living in, I can imagine it would be easy to strike fear in the minds of some of these guys. Now, Uncas is an interesting guy. We've mentioned him a few times, and we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about him in the next several weeks. But as believable as he was to some, not everybody bought into the hype. William Pinchon, a trader located on the upper Connecticut River, told the folks at Saybrook not to believe everything they heard. I mean, to me, that would be good advice. The Pequots had not shown aggression to warrant that rumor. Contradicting Pinchon and Rationale was the Plymouth Indian agent, John Brewster. He reported that Uncas had confided in him that Sasakis had actually planned two attacks on the Plymouth trade vessel. It was June when he wrote that Uncas had told him that the vessel had set sail with a good wind just before Calamity had struck through a Pequot attack. He said this was actually the second time they had avoided tragedy unknowingly. Two years earlier, the same vessel had left the harbor just hours before they were to be attacked. According to Uncas, the killing of John Stone had been completely premeditated. He reported that the Pequots knew exactly who the perpetrators were and that some lived openly among them, including Sosicus. I mean, Uncas had a big mouth. He had an ax to grind. As I said in an earlier episode, Uncas was a very skilled politician and understood the art of seed planting and manipulation. Now with that, I mean no disrespect. He was a shrewd man living in a dangerous world. He had goals and objectives and he could read the signs of the times and he used those things to his advantage. He stoked the coals both ways. He told the English that the Pequots were in fear of an English attack. The idea was that the Pequots may attack preemptively. Governor Winthrop received warnings in two different letters from John Brewster, stating in the second, quote, the Pequots continue still in their bloody minds toward the English, end quote. My problem here is that where had they displayed a bloody mind towards the English with any regularity or concentration? Seriously, where, where did that happen? This just seems like a setup. It's always a good idea to work through a rumor or unsubstantiated fear with rationale before moving too quickly. Look at the current state of affairs in our own day today. Often fear and paranoia mixed with ignorance about the other side abounds. In truth, the Pequots seem to have acted in the opposite manner as Uncas was saying. The Massachusetts Bay reaction to these events, to these rumors, was a little over the top. Ignoring the relative peace that they had enjoyed, ignoring the relative ease with which they had settled on Pequot land, 
they focused on the return of the two remaining killers of John Stone and the unpaid debt of wampum from the 1634 treaty. And again, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand the price tag was too steep to ask. The real goal was money. John Stone probably got what he deserved, and they should have just let it go at that. But they didn't. So in July of 1636, now Governor Vane of Massachusetts Bay instructed Saybrook Governor John Winthrop Jr. that he needed to meet with the Pequots to see what was going on. The expectation was that Winthrop would request nicely to meet with Sausicus. And once that meeting was secured, he was to demand both the stone killers and the wampum. If the request was denied, he was to immediately return the wampum and furs that had been given in 1634 and tell the Pequots that the peace was over, the treaty was dead. If the meeting was accepted, they were to be told in no uncertain terms that regardless of what they, the Pequot, said, the English believed the treaty had been ratified and they were indeed owed what was theirs. And failure to produce the men and the wampum would be a dishonor to the Pequots. It's funny how they frame the case, isn't it? I mean, this is a no-win situation once again for the Pequots. On top of these demands, Winthrop was to assert the rumors of the two failed attacks on the trade vessel, which we don't know if that was true or not, as well as the unsolved murder of two English traders on Long Island, which we don't know that the Pequots were involved, as truth of treachery against the Pequots. I mean, talk about dishonoring. The English were doing just that to their own cause, if you ask me. Failure to sufficiently answer to these charges would bring English revenge. So here's the scenario they've set up. They basically said, look, here's what you did. We know that this is what you did. You did this because we're telling you that you did this. So what if that charge is false or unsubstantiated? Now you're saying this is what you did because I told you that's what you did. And now you have to prove that you didn't do it. I mean, you can never win that game. That game's not designed to let you win, right? So the conference at Saybrook was arranged. Massachusetts Bay sent their own representatives. They sent George Fenwick and the Reverend Hugh Peter, who actually was Winthrop's father-in-law. Now, both of these men would ultimately find themselves back in England, and they would play important roles in the English Civil War, which was coming in just a matter of a few years. Then there was John Oldham, the senior Winthrop's trusted confidant, and a man named Thomas Stanton, who was the interpreter. Lyon Gardner was there and understood perfectly what was happening from a security standpoint. His anger was obvious going into the conference. He's said to have stated, quote, I know you will keep yourself safe in the bay, but myself, with these few, you will leave at the stake to be roasted, end quote. From a native standpoint, Saucius was there. Not Saucius, the main sacrum for the Pequots, Saucius. He was the main sacrum for the Western Niantics, the tributaries of the Pequots. It's not known if Saucius was there, although he was supposed to be, according to the English. Now, there's one thing to keep in mind when we talk about this conference is that we're leaning heavily on the records provided by the Winthrop's. And they had an objective. That was to make themselves or the Puritans or Massachusetts Bay look good and the Pequots look bad. And the odd thing is that the official notes of this meeting never survived. I tend to doubt that Sosicus was present because of what actually happened. The real demand was the killers of John Stone and the wampum from 1634, the, the full you know dose of wampum, the full amount. Here's where a real cultural divide was exposed, I think. Other people have said so, and I tend to agree. The English wanted the letter of the treaty enforced. The Pequots thought that payment enough had been made. I mean, after all, John Stone's murder had been a case of mistaken identity, so they said, and also provoked when their main sachem, Tatobem, had been killed by the Dutch. Unfairly, quite frankly, they had paid his ransom and he was still killed. And besides, they had allowed English expansion unmolested. and They had not received the promised English supplies. So according to Lyon Gardner, the English envoy returned the furs and the wampum from 1634 
saying they, quote, would have their lives and not their presence, end quote. Gardner opposed this. He said he witnessed it, quote, full sore against my will, end quote. So again, you see this cultural divide. I mean, the Pequots are looking to just move forward and trade and do business and not have any more talk of this war and all of this nonsense. John Stone wasn't a good guy. It was a case of mistaken identity. The Dutch had really done them wrong. I mean, you know, you can understand from their standpoint, from a native standpoint, from an Algonquin standpoint, that enough had been repaid. Now, what happened next not only tells me that Sosakis was not present, but frankly, it gets a little weird to my 21st century American mindset. I don't mean one aspect of this, but like the whole thing together. But then we do live in strange times ourselves. I mean, there's a lot of rumors of sellouts and a lot of sellouts in our society, in our political system. No one seems to know really what's going on or who's done what. So anyway, with the return of the goods to the Pequots, Saucius made a play of his own. He pledged all of his land to Governor Winthrop. This was a potentially big deal because what it meant was that Saucius was transferring his loyalty from Sassacus, the Pequots, to Governor John Winthrop and the English. Now, one problem he would have here was that Governor Winthrop would really be no help at all in regard to Massachusetts Bay. If he wanted to genuinely make a deal, the rightful beneficiaries would have had to have been Massachusetts Bay. I mean, does that make sense to you? So he didn't actually make a deal with the right person. Was, that, was this a legitimate offer and was it on purpose? But you begin to see what I'm talking about, where there's rumors of treachery and then there's treachery. Like sometimes we just don't know the actions of men. The reality is that we don't know the level of his sincerity. When the fighting broke out a few months later, however, he would fight with the Pequots against the English. And also, there does not seem to have been any attempt at revenge or retribution from the Pequots toward Saucius for trying to make this deal. So another cultural divide that would bear much bad fruit later may be evident here as well. If the land transfer was legitimate by Saucius, then possibly Saucius may have understood this transfer as the payment of the supposed Pequot debt to the English. I mean, the onus would be on Saucius to produce the murderers now. And Saucius would now be Winthrop's concern and not Saucius's. It'd be Winthrop's responsibility. Does that make sense to you? I mean, in the, in the Algonquin mind, that could be an easy transaction. And frankly, it's unfortunate that both sides didn't come together on some of these things. We'll never really know. But shame on the English for not attempting to understand that. I mean, isn't that really what a lot of confrontation comes down to in our lives is a lack of understanding, a lack of communication, figuring out where the other side is coming from. I mean, it's like it's like the first rule in counseling, right? To get the, the opposing parties apart and just simply ask them from their perspective what the problem actually is. So I can see how Sosakis may have thought that way if this was a legitimate offer, but that's not how the English saw it. In their eyes, the treaty was broken and they would have their revenge. Again, does this sound like an act of good faith? Do you think that the English acted honorably? I mean, maybe they did, I don't know. But it just seems like, regardless of the English or what their motives were, it seems like the Pequots could not have appeased the English delegation no matter what they did. It also seems like the entire affair, all things considered, was taken way too far by the English unless someone had an ulterior motive and was looking for an excuse to go to war. When the coming war was over, Winthrop would lay claim to the land of Saucius. But the conference, or its failure, seems to have been too much for John Winthrop Jr. At its conclusion, he left Saybrook and never returned. And he was never fully paid his wages either. So I guess there's that. What we've seen this week is the advancement of the Puritans into Connecticut almost unchallenged as they gained a foothold in Wethersfield, Windsor, Hartford, and Saybrook. We've seen the official fracture of the Treaty of 1634 and the return of Pequot gifts. We've seen the anger and wisdom of Lion Gardner 
and the steadfastness of Massachusetts Bay leadership in demanding what they believe to be within their rights. We've also seen that the rhetoric had turned to action through the conference at Saybrook. And that rhetoric and those actions would only escalate a very tense situation. It was not long after this conference that another Englishman would die at the hands of the natives. Narragansett, not Pequot. But the Pequots would bear the brunt of the consequences. It was about to get very ugly. But that's a story for next time. And until then, I hope our time together this time has really made the history to come alive. Thanks for listening to History Comes Alive. We hope today's episode has given you valuable new information and inspired you to dive even deeper. Don't forget to check out Jeff's website, historywithjeff.com, and engage with Jeff across all your favorite social media platforms at History with Jeff. Join us next time as more history comes alive.